And a We're good back. day to you, Explore Nation. John Linsky here. Season four, episode 16 of Looking Back with Linsky. And what a perfect day to have uh, this special guest on. It is the 20th anniversary celebration for the baseball team's first state title back in 2003. This man was an integral part of that. Uh, he's been at Columbus for over 30 years. Baseball coach, golf coach, math teacher explore, extraordinaire. If you've ever been around B12 during the day, high energy, lots happening, positive, uh, lights up our school. And so it is a great pleasure to introduce Mr. Charles Frazier to the show. Charlie, welcome, buddy. Thank you, John. Great to be here among the, one of the great legends, John Linsky. That's a nice way of saying I'm old, Charles, and I appreciate no, that. No, it's not. It's confirming that you are a legend. <laughs> and I've been here 30 some years, so I'm, I've been here a while and I'm old as well. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're all a, a certain age, but we're still going, and that's what matters. And, you know, Charlie, what a great compliment to you is no, you did not graduate from Columbus, but you are a Columbus guy. And that can't be said for everybody. And, and you have, I forget that you didn't go to Columbus sometimes. Uh, me, that's we'll a talk big about because that's a great place. Yeah, I love it here. 30 something years. And someone says, how much longer you got? I said, I'm on the work till I die program. You tell me. There you go. Well, hopefully that means a long time. Uh, yes. So it's great that we're getting together on the 20th anniversary of the state championship, which we will talk about as as we move through the program today. But let's go back, Charlie, and and because a lot of this I don't know. So it's going to be interesting. You are a graduate of South Dade High School, proud class of 1984. What do you remember uh, of Columbus back then, Charlie? Because I remember South Dade uh, from that time. Very tough school, tough teams in football, tough teams in baseball, tough wrestling program. When you went down to Harris Field, you were going to have your hands full. What was it like going to South Day back then? And what do you remember about Columbus? I, I will tell you, I just spent a lot of time at Harris Field growing up. <laughs> yeah. Little league in baseball. Um, man, South Day, when I was there, uh, we, at the, at, uh, we, before I was there, the baseball team had a pretty good program. And then later on, when I was there, the baseball program wasn't that successful. So when I was probably a sophomore, I was supposed to be a pretty good player, they told me. So I really wanted to go to Columbus. I actually, I didn't really look into it all the way, but I, I said, I really, I really like to go play for Columbus. It was a you know, top baseball program. So I knew about it even when I was in high school, you know. Okay. It was like a place to be. Little did I know that I'd be a coach there one day. Yeah, <laughs> funny how things work out. Um, after high school, you went to UCF, played there. Did you enjoy your time up at UCF? Yeah, the joke, the big joke, of course, Bush Dino loves it. It's like I went to the university with my own name, University of Charles Frazier. <laughs> I, I even joke with my students the first day of practice. The coach goes, oh, here you go, here you go, here you go, Charlie. I go, coach, you didn't have to get me a hat with my name on it, but I appreciate it. I'm so, not sure you appreciated that. That cockiness too much, but it was yeah, fun. but that humor is always been there. It defines you, you know. That yeah, wit, yes. Sometimes funny, sometimes not, but it's always quick. <laughs> but that's Columbus humor too. Yes. That's sometimes you, you mean sometimes unfiltered. <laughs> many times unfiltered. Yes. Um, no, but I love going to UCF. You know, I, you know, out of high school, I'm you know, I got I got an offer, I got a scholarship to play Division One baseball. You know, you think it's a big deal, and it was. And the first day of practice, I remember there was eight shortstops. <laughs> yeah. I go, oh, yeah, I'm pretty good, but maybe I should hit the books a little bit more, you know? What did you study in college, Charlie? I have an engineering degree, actually. I studied engineering. Um, I mostly focused on when I, when I graduated, I wanted to be like a production manager in the business side of it so I can maximize my earning potential, not just being engineering, but also with you know production management, quality control, inventory control. So that's what I wanted to do. Okay, so we all have a, a journey. We all have a path. When did the notion of teaching and coaching cross your mind? You, based on what you just said, what happened? Well, I have an interesting – I just thought about this morning because I thought that question might come up. When I was in high school, when I was playing high school, you know, back then the coaching wasn't like it was now, you know. But me, I was a little bit anal, so I probably did some research and read some books. And so I would help some of my – 
some of my, you know, my, my, my buddies, my teammates that help him. Even one of my friends used to call me Sparky. Okay, Sparky. He would say it like sarcastically, <laughs> referring to, you know, one of the coaches in the major league, Sparky Anderson. Yeah. So I think I always had this thing that I liked to coach, but I, didn't, I never realized it, you know. And then I used to sub when I was looking for a job for engineering. I was substitute teaching. And I started subbing because that's a nice little job, make a little cash. And then the math teachers would start asking for me when they were out because I could teach the lesson. And then some of the students were like, hey, mister, you're better than our teacher. I said, oh, that's pretty nice. <laughs> and then my savior, Mr. Joe Weber, came to me one day and said, hey, look, Charlie, we're looking for a math teacher at Columbus High School. You come coach baseball. And I go, are you sure I can do that? I was like, and the next thing you know, he talked to Brother Kevin and Brother Kevin, giant leap of faith. <laughs> Engineering degree, not a lot of, uh, I guess, you know, t- uh, experience teaching, but here I am 31 years later. So I guess he had some fairly good vision. <laughs> yes, absolutely. How did you know Webb, Charlie? Ah, well, don't, I don't know if you know this, but we're both from Homestead. Yes, I knew Webb lived down there. Yeah. He was a little smarter than me, so he knew to get out and go to school up in Miami. <laughs> so he, he was, we actually played summer ball together. He was a pitcher and I was a shortstop. And we had a great relationship because he had a really good curveball, so I had to be ready for that ground ball, you know. <laughs> so we were good friends growing up. And we played Legion ball together, and then we had lots of memories, lots of good memories. We can't share them all. Yeah, yeah, that's true. But great memories nonetheless. Uh, great memories. The best, nonetheless. You know what, Chaz? The best memories can't be shared anyway, so that's fine. <laughs> uh, what was it like for you? Go back, remember. What was it like for you to walk into an all-boys high school? You're a high-energy guy, no doubt about it. You know, you're always lit up, ready to go. So you had to sense right away, oh, man, there's a lot of energy at this place, particularly back then. Yeah, I don't I mean, because I'm that way, I don't think I recognize it being any different. I mean, I just kind of fell right in. I knew I was concerned because I was like 23, 24 years old when I first started. And you want to you know, command some respect and try not to be. It was hard. I mean, when I first got here, but I think I adapted pretty quickly, probably because I was a coach. I think that helped. But, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, I think I did it okay. That's a great point, Charlie. Why do you think, and it's not always the case, it can go either way, you don't have to be a coach to earn quick respect, but why do you think, what is it about coaching that lends credibility in the classroom? Well, that's a deep psychological question. I, I tell you, one of the things that coaching does that helps me make a better teacher, maybe this is the same answer, as I think, and this is one thing that I know that you share with me, is like we, we make a really strong effort to c- connect with our students, right? If we don't connect with our students, we're not teaching our students. So when I coach, it's important that I have a connection with that kid. So when I'm teaching, it's not me just regurgitating facts and showing formulas. I'm trying to get to know the kids, connect, give them a high five when they come in. How was your day? How was your weekend? And I think that's the connection part of it, maybe. Maybe because it's male and we always respect great athletes. I don't know. Not that I was a great athlete, but I guess you assume coaching with being an athlete. I I don't know. That's a good question. I think part of it is if you can coach, you can teach and vice versa. Because coaching is just teaching outside. And teaching is just coaching inside. A lot of us uh, follow that philosophy. But more important than that, I think you connected with the boys they knew that you cared about them, you liked them. There were, you know, lines, of course, but kids, kids, man, are the ultimate litmus test. Yeah, you can't kids fool them. Cannot, man, you cannot fool them. They may not be, you know, a genius, uh, but man, Columbus kids got street smarts and common sense, and they can they can sense a phony right away. They can also sense Charlie when you're not prepared for class. Oh, yes. And that is one of the biggest things that I've learned. When Every time I've had a bad lesson, the first thing I ask myself is, what did I do wrong? Did I, did I not prepare? Because if you're prepared and you're in your experience and you're prepared, you rarely have a bad you really have a, you rarely have a bad lesson. You know, that's very true. And it's funny. You know, everybody says, oh, kids don't want to be in school. Kids don't want to be in school. Hey, I believe our kids really like being in school. And despite everything, they want to be taught. They really do. They don't want to waste their time. You know, if they're going to be there, man, have something for me. I've walked by your room a million times. Never have I not seen something going on in there. I may not quite 
have been sure of what it was. Maybe <laughs> that's why I didn't open the door uh, yes. because what you don't know can't hurt you. But clearly things were going on. I don't think I ever saw you sitting down, you know. Yeah, I don't sit down too much. Yeah, you, I think you've got to be engaged with them. You know, it's like, and if sometimes it, you know, we have our little off topics, but sometimes that's how I get their attention. I think teaching is all about gaining the retention. Whether you open up the class talking about something and you segue into what you really want, you kind of fool them almost, you know. But you have to have their attention. And we're always doing something. And by me sitting down at the desk, that's like telling them, hey, I don't care. Do whatever you want, you know. That's a, a tremendous point. Um, and, you know, OK, history teacher. It's easy to teach history. I'm not going to lie. History is exciting. Not, I, I disagree. <laughs> I think Come I, on, know. man. What you're a great you're a great storyteller. Charles Frazier, not a great storyteller. <laughs> yeah, listen, listen. You know, it's easy to tell stories about people and events and cool things. You make math fun. And I don't know how that's even remotely possible because as a non-number person, you know, math class was like watching paint dry. But you're I don't know what you do or how you do it. I, I guess it's just your enthusiasm for life and everything you do. But man, you're, you're like fired up teaching numbers. I do get a little excited and I, they make fun of me sometimes, but I tell you what, when I, as a teacher, my one goal is here's a, here's a, here's a philosophy that I work off. When the bell rings, I want the kid to go, good. I'm going to Frazier's class and not like, Oh <laughs> crap. I got to go to Frazier's class. So by the fact that they want to be in my class, I have their attention at least from the beginning. Right. They're looking for a show I, we, a couple of years ago, one of the kids called the Frazier Show and we laughed because that's what it really is. I try to entertain. And as I'm entertaining, obviously, I'm teaching the math while I have their attention, because if, if you don't have their attention, you can't be effective educator, at least in a class where a kid doesn't want to learn, you know? Yeah. And, and Charlie, the truth is you have you have taught for many, many years the um, not yet smart. You know, well, I had, I've had a little bit of everybody. You know, I've had the college prep. I've had accelerated honors. I had all different spectrums, but. You know, kids are kids and they, they all want to learn. They learn differently. I think the main thing is what the, the ones that are a little higher get a little more stressed out about their academic grades. And but they yeah, all they like to, they all like to learn. They do. Yeah. They like to learn. I took some I took a class out, outside the other day and they when they see the math relating to the real world, but you used to come by when I was outside, see the kids and they're into it. They're trying to learn. So yeah, and and I, it it's gotta be very rewarding to get a kid who may not be mathematically inclined to see that light bulb go on, you know? Hey, I'm sorry, John, but I'm listening to Mr. Linforce come out. I'm just thinking about your great voice over the announcements and I missed that. You know, thank you. Thank you, Chaz. You we know, do Bob, have one of the Linsky disciples though, which is kind of nice too, so. <laughs> <laughs> we pass it from generation to generation. Yes, we sorry, do. You just got a little piece of my ADD right there. How'd you like that little squirrel song? Completely used to it. Uh, <laughs> wouldn't wouldn't want it any other way. Um, baseball, baseball. You love the game. Where did the love of the game come from? Man, I, that's a great. When I, I remember, I actually remember. I was probably four or five years old. I my father was a fireman. I would sit outside on the porch waiting for him to come home, and I'd be there with my bat, and he pitched me tennis balls, and I always loved baseball, hitting baseballs, and playing baseball. I moved. This is how much I like base. When I moved to, the, to when I moved to Homestead in the Relins, right? I lived on a five acre of a five acre avocado. But when I first got there, it was a tomato field, right? So okay. I literally, with by my hand, took a rake and like raked all the rocks to try to make a smooth patch to hit, to hit ground balls. That never dedication. really worked out. So instead, I got a wooden bat. And I hit probably about four billion rocks into the nursery next door. Hey. One rock at a time, right? One rock at a time. So that's probably why I got my fungo skills from hitting 400 rocks into the, I try to hit home runs, doubles, line drives, you know. Who was your favorite player growing up, Jazz, or some Ooh. of your favorite players? Well, for sure, when I was young, Pete Rose. Yeah. I love the intensity. Gonna, yeah. It makes sense, right? <laughs> Total. I love his intensity, played everything, great hitter, fiery competitor. And it kills me he's not in the Hall of Fame, but he'll be in there one day, hopefully. Uh the other people they've let in, come on, man. Yeah. Come on. Um, Although, as I got older, I learned he wasn't the quality person outside the game. But when you watch him on TV, I mean, probably one of the greatest competitors. And Listen, Ty Cobb was no angel. Yes. Yeah. I've, so I've heard, yeah. Yes. So there's that. <laughs> um, so you, you, you had a great career. You played in college. What was it like starting to work 
with high school kids because many times, as you know, you could have played and been successful, but that doesn't always translate to coaching because, you know, just do it like I do. It is not really going to help a kid that's working on his fundamentals. So what, what was your approach when you started coaching? Well, that's a good question. Um, you know, going back to, remember you said about why do coaches have like this, they have at least their attention, right? Cause if they know you played, right. If I come, I'm coming off playing division one baseball and I'm out there, at least they know I've done it. I've been there before. So I think I have their attention initially. It's up to me to maintain that and earn their trust and respect as I go forward. So, but it's, I think it's easier to start from that position. Right. Yeah. And I think the fact that I love, I really love coaching and hitting because you get a really great feedback from it. You know, when you're in the batting cage and the kid's struggling and you notice something and you don't just throw out cliches, Hey, you're throwing your shoulder open. Hey, you're doing this. Hey, you're doing that. Like some of a lot of coaches do nowadays, you're just throwing out cliches and telling you what you're doing wrong. And literally I would videotape. And this is back in the, you know, before videotaping was cool. You know, we I videotape, go home and say, Hey, I noticed that you're doing this. And so more of a cause and effect thing. And when they see you really, really care and that you're trying to make them better and not just tell them what they're doing wrong. I think that's how you kind of earn their trust because hitting is all about earning their trust. Right. Well, yeah, it's, it is probably not very few things based on much as much on self-confidence as hitting. Right. You know, because it's, Clearly, people say the hardest thing to do is hit a major league curveball, and I, no one's going to disagree with that. At this point, any major league pitch. <laughs> yeah, that true, true. And I also remember when I first started coaching, I would I would try to you know try to give them too much information all at once. Then I learned, okay, let's start from let's start from this way, let's start from the ground up, or let's pick one thing. And so it's just a process that takes quite a long time. But I think the fact that I really like doing it and I enjoy doing it, and my goal was always to make the player better, and not me. I didn't care about me. It's because that's how I get my satisfaction, right? My satisfaction only comes from your success, you know? Very good. Very good. And I think that's uh, one of the most rewarding things, you know, is, is coaching. Because when you do something, you make somebody better, and then you feel good, and then you have that moment, you know? It's kind yeah. of like coaching golf, because you mentioned the, I coached a little bit of golf, and you're on the driving range, and this guy who, who's a better player than you are, who is a great player, and one day he's struggling. Hey, coach, come look at my swing. And you go, oh, you know, are you doing this? And he, he, he sees it, he feels it, and fixes it. There's no greater feeling than, you know, helping the kid out, you know, and earning trust and respect. True coach. We'll get to golf uh, in a little bit. Yeah, sorry, um, I'm going to throw that in there. because No, 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 it's fine. Situation. There's, there's no rules here. Um, coaching with Webb. Webb, Webb, is, uh, Webb is unique. Um, Webb is someone that has developed a style that can't be imitated. You know, he's a he's a ghost whisperer, uh, you know, with pitchers and he brings out the best in kids, but still maintains very rid, rigid discipline. Yes. But Webb also understands when to praise, when not to yell. He, he he's a master of psychology. What did that, you pick, what, yeah. did, what did you pick up from Webb? That, well, yeah, master of psychology. What I would say right off the bat. The greatest, greatest leader right, uh, that I know, right? L leadership is all about leadership. He's a great leader, which makes him a great head coach. Um, going back to why, I just think that he's so disciplined what he does. And working for him was amazing because he tr we had that trust, right? I think we had the perfect combination. If you know our personalities, they're pretty much like this, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's very disciplined and serious. And I tend to, you know, be a disruptor and it was good. It was great for practice. I come out there and we, we work hard because my philosophy is always, you know, work hard, have fun. And, and we had that good balance, you know, but what I learned from him is leadership. And what I really learned from him, you know, being a player, sometimes you worry about yourself a lot. You know, you worry about your numbers and what you're doing and how you're performing. I mean, you obviously you want you want your team to win and you play hard to win. But what I really learned from, from Joe was, was the team. It was all about the team. He mm -hmm. made so many hard decisions that a lot of guys wouldn't make for the team. So definitely, obviously, leadership from him. But what a great uh, – he taught me about, you know, team. And that's what kids do. And and why he's successful, too, is he holds kids accountable. Yeah. You know, these are your expectations, and this is what I expect. And if you don't meet them, then there's consequences. That's a pretty simple formula, right? Yeah, and I think – hard to, Yet hard to execute. <laughs> well, most of our successful – most successful head coaches – Ask the most of their best players. 
they don't back off. Oh, he's a superstar. Treat him with kid gloves. No, you are a superstar to whom much is given, much is expected. And, and you see that with our most successful coaches. And I, I admire the hell out of yeah, he never right? He never babied or gave preferential treatment to any of the star players ever, not once. Yes, and, and, and that's valuable for team morale. Speaking of the team. I remember we were really quick. This is just a go fight, uh, funny side story. You know, uh, Alex Garabini, our catcher, starting catcher for four years. Guy worked harder than – I don't know if anybody worked harder than that guy in four years. Every single minute, every day, played his, played his tail off. One day, one day, one day, one pitch, he didn't get down and block a ball. And whoever gave it to him. And me and me and I were talking about it the other day. It was like that one time we started laughing. Yeah. So yeah. it's all about holding him accountable, you know. Absolutely positively. But I have Speaking great memories, Coach with Joe. It was good. Good stuff. Great stuff, actually. Speaking of the team, and it's perfect that we're doing this today. Later on this afternoon, you guys are going to celebrate the 20th anniversary of our first state major state championship when the baseball team brought it all back home, you know. Go back to 2003, Chaz, for a minute and, and talk about that team and talk about if there was ever a moment when you thought, hey, we can really do this. You had, you, you had talent, no doubt about it, but we've had talented teams before that came up short. What was it about that team, Chaz? Uh, they had some great players on there. I used to throw a batting practice. I would throw batting practice, and we lose half our balls. I, that was one thing I can tell you right there between JoJo and Garabedian and John Jay hitting doubles off the wall. And Pete. yeah, we had a lot of great players, obviously. And you know, I had no idea what state we had. I had never been that. I played at South Day. We barely we played districts sometimes, you know, so I had no idea. I just knew we were very good. We had good pitching, you know. Um, I, I didn't know. We just kept winning, and then I don't know. I don't know how to answer that question quite frankly. I just know they were good. We had a great offensive team. There were days where the other team, I felt they just couldn't get us out. We just we sent up another hitter after another hitter after another hitter, and every every one of those guys could hit. Every one of those guys could play their position. We had great pitching, great experience. There were competitors. I mean, we're talking about guys who you know played almost the whole team played college baseball, and they all played for them. They all played for the team. They were very team oriented. No way it was about me. You know, John Jay batted thirty, batted first. You know, JoJo pitched, DH played first. I mean. We, we, you know, Walter, we had some great athletes, great players yeah. in that team. We went all over to, you know, just That's great. Team. I mean, it's, it's hard to have a team that good and everybody play for the team. There, there's Coach Weber's glue again, right? <laughs> yes. And the state championship game itself, it was something right out of Hollywood where the valedictorian, Alan Sanchez, we oh, graduate man. the same day that you guys are playing up in Tampa. And it was, it was, only at Columbus could the valedictorian give his address, get on a plane, go to Tampa, go play in the game, play a major role in the victory. Oh, in field, yeah. yeah. And then win the state championship and get your diplomas at home plate from Brother Pat. Only yeah. Brother Pat could do that. What was I don't that? Think that'll, like, never, that'll never happen again. That was that was a one time moment. And another side thing is that, that game, we were losing that game, that pitcher. I never lost a high school game, I think. He was, like, unbeatable. There's, I have a photo of me and Weber, like, sitting in the dugout, like, how are we going to score a run off this guy? <laughs> and we had a leadoff single. I think Dave Paula hit a leadoff single. And then one of the things one of the things that we had done the past few years to, to make we figured to make ourselves ready to, to be the elite teams is that we had to that we had to execute better. Like, you know, bunt, you know, do the little things, you know, to help score runs. So we had really worked on our, on our bunting offense and sure enough, we put a bunt down. They, they tried to get him out of second and didn't get him. Put another bunt down. They tried to get him out of third. Didn't get it. And then Pete Rodriguez hits the double, opens the floodgates, so we end up blowing blowing him out. But it was uh, I had one, one little thing changes the whole game, you know? So Yeah, well, that's preparation, too. It was very memorable. Yeah, I would think. Memorable day. You know, Chaz, you mentioned the dugout a second ago, and every sport is different. You know, football, you've got the sidelines – basketball you've got the bench and those are more high-paced games there's a lot going on and everything else i've noticed in the dugout there's a whole social social culture to the dugout and that looks to be such an integral part of the game and building team chemistry 
What's it like just hanging in the dugout on a given day? Well, it depends on the score, the opponent. <laughs> there's, there's, there's about 47 variables in that. But I think it's important to have the team involved in the, in the game, especially like your pitching staff, because you'll have, you know, you have six, eight, nine pitchers and obviously only one is pitching. So it's important that they're in the game. And it is important to have a little bit of fun supporting your teammates. But every, I think every team has its own personality. I know one of the things we used to do, uh, I used to make them give them points or like extra credit or a T-shirt if they could steal the other team's sign just to kind of keep them in the game. So, but yeah, it's fun. It's, you know me, I like to, I like to have fun in the dugout. I mean, there's a fine line between screwing around and, and having fun, right? So of if you're course. having fun and you're playing and you're playing hard, that's, it's a game. Baseball's a game. You got to go out there, play hard, have fun and stay loose. If you're up tight all the time and everything's a job and everything matters over too much, you're not going to be as successful. But I think that, that's a good point that that psychology and that atmosphere is, is important. Yeah, it, 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 it's completely different than the other sports. You know, it just it is. is. That's a good. I never thought of that. Yeah, because a lot of times you're sitting down being quiet or you're sitting over there resting, looking at plays that you might have messed up on. Yeah, yeah. Um, but team chemistry is important, especially one good, one good, one good in control crazy guy helps a little bit sometimes as well. Absolutely, you need characters. Um, after you coach baseball, you went on to coach golf, and you followed up. Talk about legends. You followed up Dave Riley. A good friend, Mr. Dave Riley. Mr. Dave Riley, the right, greatest man. golf coach in the history of Columbus. Just a great man. Good how did you how did you get involved with golf, Charlie? Oh, let's see. Obviously, I played baseball. I always liked golf. I played, I lived by a golf course in, in Homestead, so I played a little bit of golf. I never was that good. I was just pretty good. And then out of high school, out of college, I started playing a little bit more. I got down to be a pretty good golfer. I had some good rounds in my day, so I always had a liking for it. Um, I actually coached a little bit at the end of my baseball career while I was coaching baseball. I would coach because, you know, it's, it's a different time of the year. Yeah. And I coached, I only coached about five years, but I always loved golf. And, you know, I was friends with him because I played golf. We played golf together. How about this foursome? Dave Riley, me, Lou, and Savino, Savino and O'Neill. How about oh. that foursome? Oh, Jesus. Jesus. That's, that was my first foursome at, at Columbus High School right there. And wow. I was a new guy, the young guy. They're all, you know, they're jockeying to, to, to be on my team, whatever. So we're laughing. And those guys are going back and forth at each other. It was the best four hours of my life. <laughs> You're talking about three guys that spent about 150 years at Columbus High School. No, I know. That's Hawaii. why I wanted to bring them up. Those are great names right there. Yes, absolutely. Those are some more true legends, right? Uh, yeah. Mount Rushmore legends. Uh, you know, golf is a complete, clearly completely different sport, different mindset in some ways. But in other ways, there's got to be a similarity between hitting a baseball and driving a golf ball. I would say the mental side, yeah. You know, baseball is a little bit more reactionary. You get up there, you just you're, you have an approach and you try to do it. I think golf is just so much more mental. Like you could hit 100 balls on the range perfectly. You get on that first tee and they go, now on the tee, John Linsky. And you're like, Ugh. Next thing you know, you hit it 40 yards left. So, but – so I would say psychologically, that's the hard part because hitting is such a difficult thing. Because even if you're good, you're what three out of ten. In golf, you could you're you're ten out of ten on the range, but when you get out there, you're seven out of ten. So I would say the psychology of hitting and psychology of golf that's the difficulty in it, right? Sure, sure. You got an opportunity co coaching golf though to hang with a much smaller group of kids. You know, that's a great point. And and, and, that's, and what I, that's what I loved about it because you got the. What I love, what I miss about coaching now, what I what I loved about even the golf is you're spending, you know, hours, three, four hours a day going on trips with five, six, seven guys, you know, and you really build some really close relationships, which I have done in golf, which I, I kind of, that's, that's one of the reasons I miss coaching because I miss those close connections that, you know, you spend a lot of time with these people. They're like, I just went to one of my old golfers weddings the other day, you know, it's like good stuff. Yeah. You know, there is something to be said. You can be very close to your students. Absolutely. But it's just a different deal different, yeah. when you share time and competition with a young man, you know, because you see them fail, you see them succeed, you see the joy, you see the disappointment. And there's a bond that forms there when you've been, I mean, it's, it's different than with teammates, of course, because teammates, you're sharing the experience on the field, on the diamond. But with your athletes, it's like 
okay, I've done the best I can. Now you got to go do it. And, and there's almost, I don't know, a parental pride that comes with that. And a good day to you again, Explorer Nation. John Linsky here with Charles Frazier. We're going to wrap up season four, episode 16 of Looking Back with Linsky. Had a a few technical issues pop up last time. Wardrobe. All wardrobe. wardrobe Malfunction. That's a beautiful tie, though. I've been trying Uh, to get this one in for years. You know, it matches your eyes. Uh, The question we left on, Chaz, left off on was, you coach boys here, all boys, for years and years and years. You have 20 years. Yeah, yeah, 20 years, two decades. You have two very talented players daughters who play lacrosse what has it been like for you not just as a coach but as a dad to deal with your daughters as athletes after all these years dealing with boys here at columbus dealing with boys is uh definitely a little bit more stressful i will tell you this being a father watching my daughters play together is one of the proudest moments i've had in a long time sure. but i think you know boys i probably, when i was younger i was a little bit probably a little bit more intense so i've learned to try to try to maintain my intensity some and, you know, try to have fun and try to enjoy it, try not to overcoach. Because I know when I coach, I didn't want parents yelling at my kids, hey, do this, do that. So I think being a coach does help as a parent sometimes. Um, and pretty much I just tell them two things. Hey, have fun and play hard. The only thing that I hold them accountable to is play, if they're playing hard, that's all I need. And then usually when they play hard, success comes from that. So, But I've, I've enjoyed every moment of it. That's great. I mean, and. I'm sure having a common bond of sports with your daughters, it helps the father-daughter relationship. Yeah, one of the things that I've done since they're little girls, I've tried to teach them how to play everything, how to play. We play catch, we play box ball, we play tennis, we play golf, we play, I mean, basketball. They ended up playing lacrosse and soccer, two sports I never I never knew how to play, which is, which is perfect. Probably, exactly. on, probably on, on, on purpose. And my other daughter actually swam, which is even probably my, like my least favorite sport because I couldn't, I didn't know how to hardly swim, but. How's that possible? You well, I mean, I could swim. I, could swim you know, okay. I mean, I don't think I had the eight uh, with my ADD. I probably couldn't go back and forth that many times in a row <laughs> and not get bored. <laughs> That's true. Hmm. All right. Listen, and I think I said this at the beginning of the episode. Sometimes I forget you didn't go to school here because you are a Columbus guy. And so when somebody uses that term and we use it all the time around here, Columbus guy, what comes to your mind? I don't know. I think that might have came through uh, osmosis. I don't know. I've been here for, like I said, over 30 years. So just watching people, you know, just coming here, working hard, having a good time and, you know, taking things serious. But then sometimes not taking it too serious. I, like I said, like, like I tell my dad, I like to work hard. I have a good work ethic and I like to have fun. I think that balance is important, you know, to get the t- kids attention and have them excited about coming into your class. So I've always tried to do that. I love being here. I, I, I reflected sometimes about maybe doing something else. I'm like, I can't leave this place. I mean, I spent too much of my life here and try to build some kind of reputation. So it's a great place to live and I'm proud to be a part of it. Yes, indeed. Another phrase we use a lot around here and everybody's got their own uh, interpretation of this. To Charles Frazier, what does being Marist mean? Uh, That's a good question. I, you know, one of the things I always remember brother Kevin, this goes back to him is like, teach them all, you know, you got to teach them all. And, you know, being a parent, sometimes, you know, you it, you think about some kid who's struggling or maybe not doing his work and it's easy to dismiss that student. But I actually kind of like look at that as a challenge. So I think it's trying to teach everybody, trying to let all the students know that you care about their yeah. their outcomes. And I think that's what I try to do. It was funny. I was just talking to my students about that because we you had you had let, let that question at the back. I'm going to tell them that. But I said, guys, what do, what do you think? What's about being married? And he started talking about that you care about what's going on and. You know, if I if I give a student a hard time, he knows it's because I want him to do well, not just because I want to be you know funny or try to make him look. It's not good. personal. It's not personal. I'm trying to motivate him. You know, different ways of motivating students. So different ways of motivating different students. Some things work with some kids. It won't work with others. Exactly. And sometimes you, you got to be hard. Sometimes you got to blow the smoke. Sometimes you got to stroke him. You know. Hey, you're doing so well. Even when you're lying. <laughs> you <laughs> you know? got to sell it though. Yeah, you got to sell it. Yes, you're going to go to college. Sure, you'll be successful. You're going to marry a beautiful woman. And, and going back to the, I think Columbus slash Maris is creating relationships with students. I think maybe when you're in the public school, maybe you're afraid to do that. But I really, I relish that. I mean, I love creating relationships with these students and having respect to you and earning their respect. I think that's that's important. And those relationships continue after they graduate. Oh, when they come back, yeah, five, ten years, you're like you're doing well. I, I thought you were. I just wasn't hundred percent sure. Listen, you said something a moment ago. You, you've wanted to make your reputation here. Trust me. 
your reputation is sealed here. You you Thank are you. one of the cornerstones of this school. You're certainly a cornerstone of the math department. You've done so much for so many kids. And it's it's been a real pleasure to do this with you and, and getting to sit here next to you. I mean, I think it's a little easier. Like it's much easier time. sitting next to this guy than it is across the you're well, sitting in a sterile room. Yeah. yeah. Afraid to take in the oxygen. So hey Bob. I appreciate it. Hey Bob, Thank that's you. right. Yeah. Hey Bob. There it is. There it is, trademark. So Explore Nation, I hope you've enjoyed this conversation with the great Charles Frazier. Look forward to many more. We got a big one coming up, as a matter of fact. You'll find out about that one soon. So until then, take it easy and Adelante. And as always, buenos tiempos. I like that. Yeah, man.